The Bible reading for today is from Exodus 2, verses 11 to 25. One day, after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labour. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Looking this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day, he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters and they came to draw water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away but Moses got up and came to their rescue and watered their flock. When the girls returned to rule their father, he asked them, why have you returned so early today? They answered, an Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. And where is he? Rule asked his daughters. Why did you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. Moses agreed to stay with the man who gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. Zipporah gave birth to a son and Moses named him Gershom, saying, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard at their groaning and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see all of your masked faces in the audience. It's very, it's different. It's very different, but um, it's good to be here. And I was just so encouraged to see that we were able to worship God and sing about how marvelous he is in the midst of discomforts like this and welcome to all of you who are online as well we know that many are online today also and we're so glad that you could join us if i haven't met you before i'm ben i'm the community pastor here and we're going through exodus 2 verses 11 to 25 together and i want to start by asking you a question has there ever been a time in your life where you have felt hopeless has there ever been a time in your life where you have felt hopeless. I'm sure many of us can think of times where we experience that. Maybe right now, for you, it's a loved one. They have a, a character flaw, an addiction, a sin issue. You want to help them with it, but they just cannot seem to change. It feels hopeless. Maybe you are the one with a sin struggle in your life, and no matter how many times you try to overcome it, You just don't seem to be able to win. And if you haven't thrown in the towel already, you feel like you want to. You feel hopeless. Maybe it's coming into the start of 2021, and you were hoping that it would be a better year, but we started the year in lockdown, and you're wondering when this pandemic is going to be over. You feel hopeless. We only need to live for a little while to know that the evils outside of us and inside of us Uh, how uh, difficult to overcome in and of ourselves we're not in control we're powerless we're hopeless and in our passage today Israel had every reason to be hopeless in chapter one they had grown to become a large nation but they hadn't yet come into the land that God had promised them in fact they remained in Egypt under an oppressive ruler Pharaoh who made them slaves, who subjected them to harsh labor, who even created laws that said that every Hebrew boy that was born was to be killed. This was an oppressive ruler. And you can imagine how they must have felt. They must have felt powerless and hopeless. Even though Israel had much reason to feel hopeless in this story, 
there's an even greater reason to have hope. And the very reason that the Israelites could have hope in their predicament is the very same reason that we can have an unbreakable and robust hope today, despite what we are facing. So let's open up the passage and let's see what hope it gives us. And in the passage, there are three scenes. Moses in Egypt, Moses in his time in Midian, and God in the heavens. Don't need to write those down, but those are three scenes that we're going to see in this story. Moses' time in Egypt, in Midian, and then God in the heavens. Now, before we look at Moses' time in Egypt, I want us to notice something at the beginning of the chapter and how it sets us up to view Moses. When Moses was born, Exodus 2 verse 2 tells us that his mother saw that he was a fine child. The Hebrew word for fine there is the Hebrew word tov. And it's the same word for good that God used in Genesis 1 where after each day of creation, he would, it would say he saw that it was good, that it was tov. So when the exact same language is used here in Exodus chapter 2, it's signaling something to us. When it says that Moses' Moses's mother saw that he was tov, it's signaling to us that perhaps God was doing a new creative work, that this boy was special, that perhaps God was raising up a rescuer, a deliverer to help the nation. And it's no surprise then that he miraculously escapes um, Pharaoh's murderous edict. He doesn't get put to death. In fact, he's put in a reed basket in the Nile and he gets taken up by Pharaoh's daughter and even adopted into the Egyptian family. Some mysterious hand seems to be at work preserving this boy's life, and we're wondering as we come into our passage, how will he turn out? What will he be like? Well, let's take a look at Moses in Egypt. When we arrive at our passage, it opens up with one day when Moses had grown up. Now, a long time had passed in these few words. Moses wasn't some pubescent teenager at this point. Actually, Acts chapter 7 tells us that he was 40 years old. He had spent 40 years in the halls of power, in the Egyptian royal family, 40 years in Egyptian culture, being educated in their ways, enjoying the power and the wealth that comes in being in that kind of family. And our question is, how is this going to affect him? Will he choose to align himself with the Egyptians and have a comfortable life? Or will he, in fact, be a good thing for Israel? Will he, in fact, identify with Israel? Well, if we read on, it says that when he had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens. I love how the scholar Walter Kaiser Jr., he says that word for looked implies sympathy and real emotional involvement. That's what was happening in Moses' heart as he was looking at his people in slavery under their burdens. An emotional burden was building up within him and he wanted to help them. He was moved. He cared for Israel. And part of what these first few verses do is to establish Moses' identification with Israel. In Hebrews 11, it says, by faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He chose to be an Israelite, not an Egyptian. And as he walks further out into the city, he sees something horrifying. He walks further out and he sees an Egyptian ruthlessly beating one of his Hebrew brothers. And the Hebrew word for strike there is the word Nahar, Nahar. This was a severe strike and it could result in death. And when Moses saw this, he was outraged. He, he was, his desire welled up within him to do justice. So he went over and he gave Nahar to the Egyptian and killed him. Now, this isn't a picture of uncontrollable rage, of, of Moses sort of sinfully embracing anger. Instead, it's actually a controlled and a considered reaction. It says in the text that he looked around to see who was watching. He struck the Egyptian, killed him, and then buried him. 
The next day, Moses went out again. And you wouldn't believe what he saw this time. It was absolutely shocking. He went out and he saw an Israelite dishing out Nahar to a fellow Israelite. He was shocked. One of his brothers was oppressing another one of his brothers. Wasn't it enough that the Egyptians were already oppressing them? Did they have to do it to each other as well? And so Moses just couldn't help himself. He, his, he was outraged again and he stepped in. But this teaches us an important lesson. The fact that Moses saw an Israelite oppressing another Israelite. You see, the Egyptians weren't the only oppressors in the story. The Israelites were oppressing each other too. And this reveals something to us. Even though we can be victims at times, all of us have the capacity to oppress others. All of us have what the Bible call is what the Bible calls sin. The capacity to, to screw things up and to hurt others. Humanity is contaminated by it. And this is why even during his own torturous stint in prison, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, he was a Russian, he experienced terrible things in the Russian gulag prisons. And he was able to say this. He said, the line separating good and evil passes not through my torturers only, not through the people who are pressing me, but right through every human heart and through all human hearts, implying also his own. Alexander had the courage to admit this about himself, even though he had been brutally victimized. And my question is, what about you? What about you? Have you had the courage to admit, like Alexander, that in you is that same capacity to oppress? To humbly admit that not all is right within us, but that we do have a sin issue. Our culture will tell us that we're fundamentally good, that if we just have the right conditions, we would be better people. If we had the right education, if we had the right economic conditions, enough money, if we just had the right conditions, we'd be far, far better. But the Bible tells us something different. Romans 3 says, there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All are contaminated by sin. And my question is, have you had the courage and the humility to admit this? You will never have the ability to enjoy Jesus and enjoy the gospel until you get to this place. Even though Israel suffered under Egypt, Israelites were still causing suffering to one another. When Moses was confronted with this evil, he stepped in and he moved to intervene. He goes up and he says to the man in the wrong, why do you strike your companion, your comrade, your friend? But the man didn't lower his head in shame. He was bold and brazen. He said, who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Now, there's a veiled threat in that statement. Moses didn't know that his actions were known, but this man makes sure that he does know and that his help isn't welcome. Moses was, humanly speaking, Israel's only chance at getting out of their predicament. He was in the halls of power. He was in the Egyptian royal family. And yet, instead of thanking Moses or accepting his help, this Israelite threatens him. The deliverer God seemed to be raising up was rejected by the people he wanted to save. Moses was shaken. He didn't expect any of this. And he realized that once Pharaoh found out that he had aligned himself with Israel, his life would be in danger. And it says that Pharaoh did seek to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian. So the first scene ends in shambles. Moses' appearance seemed promising for Israel, but he ends up fleeing for his life, powerless to save his people, and in fact, rejected by them. This is what we learn in the first scene with Moses in Egypt. And so now our question is, is it all over? What's going to happen next? Will Moses return? What's going to happen? Well, let's take a look at Moses in Midian. Moses in Midian. 
So Moses ends up as a refugee, an alien with no rights in a foreign land. And he sits down by a well. And as he sits there, he notices seven women coming in his direction. And they're bringing this flock with them. And they they come to the well where he's at and they empty some water into the troughs to, to water their animals. And as that's happening, some local shepherds come by and water was a precious resource in, their, in that day. So the shepherds decided to bully the woman out of the water, to contest it, to drive them away. So as they started to do that, Moses was sitting there and he was watching this unfold to these strangers and he just couldn't help himself. He had the heart of a rescuer. He had to intervene. So it says that he got up and he saved them. He saved them. Here we learn something about Moses. He has a deliverer's heart. This is the third time in the story that he intervenes to deliver people. He not only cares for Israel, but he cares for anyone who was oppressed and mistreated, even if they have absolutely nothing to do with him. So he saves these strangers. Verse 17, he does their work for them. And they end up returning to their father earlier than they usually would. So their father asks them, why? They replied, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and even drew water for us and watered the flock. In Hebrew, they repeat the fact that he drew water twice because they're just so baffled by the fact that he not only saved them, but he did their work for them. Moses had nothing to do with them. They weren't his problem. And he not only risked his neck for them, but he did their work for them by watering their flock. So their father was like, where is he? Why have you left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. Now let's pause again for a moment here. Can you see the contrast between this foreign family and Israel? Israel weren't grateful for Moses' help. They rejected him. This foreign family who had nothing to do with him or Moses as God accepted him gladly. In fact, the father gave Moses his daughter Zipporah in marriage in verse 21. There's a subtle rebuke in this story for anyone who thinks they're an insider on the things of God. There's a subtle rebuke for Israel in this story and for anyone else who thinks they're an insider in the things of God. Israel may have thought that God loved them, that they were secure in God's favor because of their skin color, because of their national heritage, because of their family line. And they made that mistake often throughout the Bible, and they were corrected time and again. And as we open up the New Testament, John the Baptist rebukes some of the Jewish religious leaders, and he says, God is even able to raise up children of Abraham from these stones if he wants. Ultimately, it's not about your ethnic heritage about humble faith in God. Romans 9 says, not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. In other words, not all who are ethnically Israelite belong to the true Israel, to the true Israel of God, the people of God. Those who humbly come to God in faith are those whom he favors. And God's plan all along has been to make a multi-ethnic, multi-racial, multilingual people of God. That's why in Revelation we see all tribes and tongues and nations, all sorts of people worshipping him in the end. If there's anything that we think gives us an inside view into the things of God, whether it's our skin color, whether it's our financial status, whether it's how long we've been involved in the church or whether our family grew up in it, this passage challenges us and reminds us to humbly accept God's grace, to humbly approach him. And it reminds us as a church as well that we're to welcome everyone to Jesus. Anyone who walks through these doors, if they're different to us, if they're different culture, different financial status, different education, we're to welcome them to Jesus because Jesus welcomes all those who humbly put their faith in him. It's a beautiful little lesson there for us. So Moses, the Israelite, had found a new home and a people who welcomed him. But we can see in the text that Moses is still grieved. His heart is still to save his people in Israel. So even at the birth of his first child, this beautiful occasion, he says this, Moses named him Gershom, saying, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. 
Now, there's a play on words going on here because that word Gershom in Hebrew, that sounds like the phrase, a foreigner there. So it's basically like Moses named him a foreigner there, saying, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. Moses felt hopeless. His heart was still with Israel. He wanted to help them, to rescue them. But he was a powerless refugee in a foreign land, unaccepted by the people he wanted to save. So I guess the question is, what's going to happen now to Israel? And especially, where is God in this story? He hasn't been mentioned once in our chapter so far. Human Moses wanted a good thing to save Israel, but he was powerless to do it. They needed someone greater. Was God absent? Had he given up on his covenant people, the people he'd given his promises to? Did God even care about the oppression and the pain and the slavery and the Hebrew boys that were being killed? Well, in our final scene, God is mentioned five times. And we get to see his perspective. We get to see his heart for Israel. Let's look at it. God in the heavens. God in the heavens. It opens up with verse 23, which says, During those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. I love the fact that their cry went up. A divine actor is now present. Someone with the ability to overcome is at hand. But how would he respond? What would he do with the cries of Israel? Well, we get our answers in verses 24 to 25. And God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew God knew. God had not forgotten the covenant he had made with Israel's forefathers. He had not forgotten the promises he had made to to give them a special land and to bless them. Even though Israel may have felt hopeless and abandoned and forgotten, their God had not forsaken them. He had not rejected them. He cared. Their pain was personal for him. Their pain was personal for him. We know this not only because of his personal covenant with them, but because Moses' actions and heart and the story actually clue us in to God's actions and heart. Let me explain. Moses' heart foreshadows God's heart in this passage in several ways. So in verse 11, it says, Moses went out to his people and looked. The Hebrew word ra'ah, he looked on their burdens. Just as God looked, ra'ah, upon his groaning people in verse 25. Moses struck down Nahar, the Egyptian, in verse 12. Just as God promised in chapter 3, I will stretch out my hand and strike Nahar, Egypt, with all the wonders that I will do in it. The seven daughters told their father, Moses delivered them out of the hand of the shepherds. Just as God would say, I have come to deliver Israel out of the hand of of the Egyptians. Moses looked upon the people, God looked upon the people. Moses struck down an Egyptian, God would strike down the entire nation if he needed to. Moses delivered the the women from a handful of shepherds, God would deliver his entire people from the hand of Egypt. Moses' actions anticipate God's actions. Moses' heart for Israel actually represents God's heart. God deeply cares for his people. And in fact, verse 25 tells us that God knew their suffering. God knew. The Hebrew word for knew is the word yada. It's a beautiful word. It's a word that's used to describe a husband and a wife, how they know each other deeply in marriage. So it's far more than intellectual. It's personal, even experiential for God. God knew Israel's groaning. God knew Israel's suffering. God knew Israel's feelings of abandonment. You see, Moses' actions, as well as the profound statement that God knew Israel's groanings, 
together anticipate another character later in the biblical story. They anticipate one in whom both human and divine are present. They anticipate Jesus. We have a little hint of this in our passage. You see, before Jesus came to earth, the Jews translated their scriptures from Hebrew into Greek. And the Greek word they used for the groans of the people in chapter 2, the groaning under their slavery, is used only once in the New Testament. And it's used in Matthew 27, verse 46. On the cross, under the crushing weight of our sin, Jesus cried out, same that one Greek word, with a loud voice saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God, in the second person of the Trinity, knows a kind of suffering that we cannot even imagine. And when Jesus experienced the suffering that Israel really deserved, the suffering that you and I deserve for our capacity to oppress, he cried out under it. But his cry was ignored so that if you and I cry out to God, we never will be. Jesus' cry was ignored so that yours and mine will never be. You see, we're just like Israel in the story. We may not be literally enslaved to an evil empire, but we experience slavery in different ways. In the Bible, it talks about it in places like Romans chapter 6, where it talks about how sin and death try to rule over us and dominate us and control us. The Bible talks about Satan as our accuser and as a type of ruler of this world who wants to enslave us. All of us have experienced the power of these evils in our lives and at times it can feel crushing. Maybe it's the power of personal sin that you feel crushed by. This sin, this addiction, this issue has reared its ugly head yet again and you feel powerless to overcome it. You feel enslaved to it. Maybe it's a loved one. Maybe you see them under the power of death and decay, and it breaks your heart. It crushes your spirit seeing them under that kind of suffering. Maybe for you, it's the power of Satan. It's that voice that accuses you again and again, night and day, that says, you're not good enough. You're not spiritual enough. You're not righteous enough. You're not pretty enough. You're not kind enough. That accusing voice who wants to enslave us and keep us condemned and guilty. If there is even a hint of discouragement or hopelessness in your life, Exodus chapter 2 and the witness of the entire Bible tell us to take heart. We have someone in our corner who takes our pain personally. We have a divine friend who cares for us. We have someone who, when confronted with our sin and with our ugly parts, did not turn away his head in disgust, but was willing to take it upon himself and groan under its weight on the cross. We have a Savior who submitted himself to death so that we would have the hope of resurrection. We have a God who nailed Satan's accusations to the cross, destroying them so that he now has no ability to accuse us because Jesus has served the penalty that we deserved already. We have Jesus, fully man, fully God, a rescuer who not only chose to identify us with us so fully that he took on the weakness of our humanity, but a rescuer with the power and the authority of God, with the power to overcome those things that enslave us. We may feel at times as if God is absent, as if he doesn't care. But Jesus' cry of dereliction shows us that not only is God for us, but that he knows a depth of suffering that we will never have to experience. God sees you. God hears you. God knows Recently, my wife and I stumbled upon the story of a family from South Australia. They're Christians, 
And over a couple of short years, they saw their firstborn son suffer and ultimately succumb to a terminal heart condition. He was only a couple of years old. And his mother writes about her pain. She said, One year ago, I kissed Harry's warm forehead for the last time before he was wheeled into a procedure from which he never woke up. Our hearts ache for him today as much as they did that day. Our lives are now divided into before and after, shaped by that constant reality that he is gone and we will never cuddle him in our arms again, that we'll never see him grow up. The grief is always there just below the surface, even when we smile and laugh and experience the joys of life. We are slowly learning to live without him. Have we had a choice? But that emptiness does not go away because our love for him has not diminished. He will always be our precious firstborn son and our hearts will never stop missing him. This couple faced a test of suffering as bad as they come in this world. But how did they respond? What did they end up concluding about God? How did Jesus help them? This is what she said one Easter Sunday. She wrote, I'm not going to pretend that I don't have questions of God, that my faith hasn't taken a beating, that I don't have doubts, misgivings, and fears. But today, as I stand looking at the empty tomb, I just keep thinking, where else would I go? Where else would I find a certain hope of life beyond the grave? Who else has dealt with the brokenness of this world and has put death to death forever? As far as I can see, it's only Jesus. The promise of a better future is only possible because he lives, so here I stay. Only the good news, only the gospel can produce hope in the midst of that kind of suffering. Only when the Spirit of God opens our eyes to see the beauty of Jesus, the suffering of Jesus, the victory of Jesus, will we have the ability to endure heavy burdens in this life with hope. Only when we see that Jesus was forsaken upon the cross will we know that God has not forsaken us despite whatever problems we are facing. In fact, in the words of Dane Ortland, and I'll finish with this, is that the testimony of the New Testament is that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. The same Christ who wept at the tomb of Lazarus weeps with us in our lonely despair. The same one who reached out and touched lepers puts his arm around us today when we feel misunderstood and sidelined. The Jesus who reached out and cleansed messy sinners reaches into our souls and answers our half-hearted plea for mercy with the mighty, invincible cleansing of one who cannot bear to do otherwise. Jesus is our rescuer. Jesus is our friend. Jesus is in our corner. Jesus knows, he sees, he hears, and we're going to enjoy that relationship today. We're going to praise him for what he's done, and we're going to pray to him right now. Let's pray, church. Father, we bring our heavy hearts to you. Whatever is burdening us right now, Lord, we we lay it at your feet. We thank you, God, that you see, that you hear, and that you know. More than we can understand, you know our suffering, and you know the suffering of cross and judgment. Lord Jesus, for this we praise you. For this we worship you. And Lord, we pray that you would give us a deeper experience of your care and your kindness and your love. And that we would know that we have access to one who listens to us, who is deeply concerned for us. So Lord, we bring ourselves to you wholeheartedly today. Where else would we go? As far as we can see, Only you, Jesus, have overcome death. Only you have overcome the grave. Only you have defeated sin and Satan. And so we put our hope in you today. We worship you in this place. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Church, would you stand?
we're going to respond. But I just want to read this blessing over you from Romans 16, verse 20. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you.